Hello and welcome to Rajya Sabha Television. You're watching The Big Picture with me, Frank Rausen Pereira. Well, Union Finance uh, uh, Minister Nirmala Sitharaman said that the government does not favour laws that treat business houses with suspension, uh, suspicion, I beg your pardon, and was working towards decriminalising the company's law. Sitharaman said that apart from decriminalising corporate laws, settling tax disputes and privatisation of uh, government-run firms are on the agenda to achieve the $5 trillion economy goal. The government has already identified statutory changes to be made in the Companies Act that decriminalise procedure lapses and do not affect uh, public interest as part of its effort to improve ease of doing business. About 46 amendments to penal provisions may be made to either remove criminality or restrict punishment to only fine or allow rectification of defaults using alternatives to declog the criminal justice system in the country. The intention now is to extend this exercise to laws dealing with income tax and money laundering. On this edition of The Big Picture, we will analyse the steps being taken to boost the economy. Joining me on the programme today are Ajay Brahme, Corporate Lawyer, Shubhamoy Bhattacharji, Consulting Editor of The Business Standard, and Ajay Dua, former Secretary, Ministry of Commerce and Industry. Thank you to all my guests for joining me on this edition of The Big Picture. Mr. Dua, let me begin the programme with you. What do you make of the idea of decriminalising corporate laws? I think let's first look at the overall uh, purpose for which, about which he talked and which was mentioned by, this was in reply to a question of Mr. Chandrasekhar, mm. Chandrasekharan, the TCS president, who a uh, chairman who happened to be there and who has been voicing concern that it's become difficult to do business in India. And the background, of course, is that from the ramparts of the, Rad, of, of the Red Fort, the Prime Minister... Mr. Narendra Modi had in his Independence Day speech itself assured the country that he would be attending to issues which are affecting the business, particularly on grounds, such grounds of prosecu uh, frequent prosecution and kind of fear of the law. So that was the background. Here, I think the comments which the finance minister made, I would support all of them highly needed and you need them not only in the in the company law but also in the tax laws as well as in the money laundering act you have provisions i, I would say one extreme is the united states where a, a whole lot of law a whole lot of offenses can be compounded i think a very large income of the authorities at the provincial level and in the central federal level is through offenses compounded by banks of banks particularly during the sanction times mm. six billion dollars one bank charged another charge four billion dollars and that kind of a thing the so with that background and then certain countries where probably some of them even in the gulf where everything is looked at even more suspiciously than us and probably the judicial system is not as strong, as transparent as it should be. So we are somewhere in between. between. And the finance minister's comments and assurance has a background that in 2019, an amendment uh, to the Co Corporate uh, Company Affairs Act was made where certain minor, -ish minor offences were made, uh, were subjected to this liberal interpretation and the law was amended. Yet, the major ones remain. A committee which you talked about saying that the government is ready. Yes, a committee has been formed. It has given its recommendations and the government would probably be acting on it soon. Hmm. Desirable as it might be and, the, and also that these 46 uh, recommendations which have seemed to have been made and which are pending for consideration have been classified into eight different categories of offenses. I would think that one principle that we have to have a not swing extremely in any way from one to the other, but keep in mind that the milieu in which we are operating the ecosystem of the country and then decide what should be just attracting penal fines or alternate mechanisms 
uh, or what should continue to remain as deterrents. Hmm. I say this, and I'm sure my colleagues would say that. Sorry, I've taken a little extra time. That we should be looking at what is an offence under the Indian Penal Code for individuals. That continues to remain an offence when it is committed at a corporate level, level as well. Yeah. The otherwise we would say as an individual you are liable, but not as a corporate. Mm. And at corporate level, you are many people to decide. Individual probably decides on his own. Hmm. If he conspires with someone, then he is also booked under a conspiracy charge under Section 120B. So, I would say let's find firstly a principle to decide that what is an individual offence should continue to remain when greater wisdom is applied, particularly when the char when the offences are committed against larger number of people, shareholders, stakeholders are much more, then look at what should be the penalties. Otherwise, I mean the IPC also, which probably dates back to the English colonial right. period. Right. But a reasonable way of look going forward is called for. Okay. All right, Shubhoy. Uh, so, let's not forget that the statement of the finance minister follows Mr. Chandrasekharan's uh, statement as well, where he's uh, suggested on similar lines that industry needed supervision and not suspicion. So, after this, do you think that the spirits in the industry is, is going to be improved? Uh, spirits would depend on, I mean, how the law provisions are changed. Mm. So, as and when the things come along. You must also remember that, uh, I mean, it's, it's a very good point to actually reduce these sort of things because what essentially happens is a country which is not able to get its policing act properly is uh, it, uh, takes a big risk if it says that my policing is not good but and my con enforcement of contract is not good yet i'll pile it on with more and more number of criminal cases you know that essentially clogs the system it helps no one it simply ends up creating the fear of uh, i mean the state and that i think that is that is where the point is that the state would itself be doing itself a lot of benefit by saying that let's remove the power of, I mean, let's ensure that the police, you know, because that, that, that itself is actually where India has got a major weakness. But the prosecution itself is very weak. So, let's, let's, in, let's not burden it with too many further laws to sort of, you know, to try to look around. And that is where uh, there's a benefit necessary. But also, one must remember that we have got certain commitments under what is called the FATF. And there, a lot of cases, in fact, for the stock exchange and others, which were essentially civil offences, once we signed on the FATF, became criminal or were liable to have made criminal offences. So, there is also an international commitment there. For instance, you know, money laundering. Now, money laundering is something which is very difficult to convert into a civil offence, even though there have been a lot of cases about it. Because money laundering is something under the FATF. And under the FATF, we are guided by the OECD guidelines. And, and, and there, to try to make it a civil, a civil offence will be fiendishly difficult. Also, the fact is that in the wake of the several corruption accusations that came up in the 2011-2013 to 2013 period, when so many of those scams and other things came up, the public demand became of exemplary punishment. And exemplary punishment couldn't necessarily, the state couldn't necessarily be seen as handing out exemplary punishment if it was just giving out a compounding offence. So, if a party rides on the basis of saying that I shall be giving out exemplary punishment, the people then demand that that exemplary punishment should mean, per learning of public wealth, should mean a jail term. You know, that, that's the equivalence that is often made. To say now, I mean, to, so, so, so the government has actually to take, and, and this is a very major step that the government is taking, and it will be a very useful step, mm. because probably if we can do this, our rank on enforcement of contracts will actually rise up substantially. But it will have to be done with a lot of what I call educating the public generally that punishing or putting somebody in jail creator of wealth isn't necessarily the way wealth creation across the society is encouraged. People have to be, I mean, 
so while there is always be a case like the fugitive offenders, we have talked about the economic uh, fugitive offenders uh, case and that is entirely criminal. There has to be other cases where the person is not looked at as a criminal for a business risk gone awry. Right. And that would mean that, you know, taking the entire provision of tax laws and everything, everything will have to be cleaved out. Mm. But as I said, when cleaving out, we have to also be remembering that FATF regulations say that some are not allowed to be cleaved out okay. from criminal to civil. Right. So, Ajay, let me bring you to the picture now. So, uh, what kind of tweaks, what kind of uh, changes do we need to see in some of these laws? What is desirable? See, I think to answer your question, I think we should also look at the genesis or rather how it all started. So, it all started. So, it's not first. Firstly, this decriminalization thing, which is happening in the business laws in general, is nothing new. It started way back in 1991, since 1991. So, initially there was this Export-Import uh, Act, Imports and Exports Act, which was changed, which was, I would say, you know, a new act came, which was called as Foreign Trade Act. Similarly, initially there was this FERA Act, 1973, which was replaced by FEMA. So, you know, these, these new acts came actually with a view to decriminalize the thing, things so that more and more investors from outside especially, they may be lured to come and do business in the country. That is one. Secondly, having said this, when you say as to which all provisions or you know how it should happen, I would say that decriminalization is fine, but provisions which involve fraud or uh, where public interest is involved, I think in case you decriminalize such provisions, then uh, perhaps the confidence of even those people who intend to come to the come back come to the country, even that will be shaken. For instance, uh, the CSR clause, a two percent clause, which general public knows as. Initially, it was brought in with a you know it was brought in not it was not uh, there, there was no penal consequences. Then, towards the end of nineteen. Uh, or somewhere like uh, 19, yeah, 18. 18. It, some penal provisions were added to it. In case you do not comply with it, then there will be three years imprisonment. Yeah. Then it has further, now once again it has been decriminalized. Likewise, there are several other provisions like conflict of interest for instance, in case there is a disclosure requirement. These are some of the, uh, some of the very important things and you know serious uh, matters which should not be decriminalized in my opinion. Right. Having said this, in case as uh, sir has already stated, see this is, if I may say so, this is like a special statute meant for business, the company law, whereas uh, IPC and those criminal uh, statutes are general statutes. There is this principle in case there is a special statute which provides for you know, so, so the special, it is a maxim called as generally a specially bus non derogant So, in case there is a special statute which uh, that will over, I mean the its effect will override the effect of general statute. So, in case some, some offense is, has been decriminalized in special statute, whereas it still is an offense under uh, IPC. IPC. So, then it cannot be treated un, under section 320. Section 320 CRPC is for uh, compounding of yeah. offences. Yeah. So somebody who has actually done some kind of a uh, some kind of an offence under Companies Act, he can always plead that look, uh, you know, and suppose some penal some um, uh, IPC offences were to be uh, uh, lodged against him, he can always say that look, I have not done it within the parlance of uh, IPC. I have done it within the purview of Companies Act, so I am exempted. Now that cannot be done, as Sir has already mentioned. See. Even if there is an offence, th section 320 is, uh, of CRPC provides for compounding of offences. And there are certain offences uh, and there, is, there are three lists. So, it can be compounded only by the name of the person who is mentioned in the third, uh, third column. In case there is a provision which is compoundable under IPC, even those provisions in case it is read with conspiracy 120 B as Sir has said, then it cannot be compounded. Right. Because it really involves meeting of mind that mm, animus mm, element mm, comes mm. into picture. Now, here also when you start, when you form a company, you certainly has that animus. You certainly have that animus to do some business together. 
in case and in the course of doing this business in case you commit an offense then shouldn't that be treated as an offense right. now that's that is something which we need to ponder about and that is how this decriminalization exercise need to be balanced with okay shubham i doesn't seem to agree with you no uh, uh, the reason is that you know as uh, ajay rightly pointed out i mean these are is issues which are good deep areas of jurisprudence mm. and typically our tax machinery corporate law machinery are not equipped to handle so many such cases once they come up the volume overwhelms which is why the cases run for long time helps no one which is what mr chandrashekhar was pointing out others have also pointed out essentially i think it's a good idea to you know sort of agree that probably we should be a bit more liberal allow things to be you know allow for good prosecution of few cases and let most of the cases go through the example is vincent satyam in satyam we ran a very complicated long case where frankly speaking we didn't achieve much except in getting ramalinga raju because there were lots of others but as the sec compounding offense punishment on price water of scoopers was so effective so clean and so clearly argued that pwc had to had to sort of agree to it pay up the damages and sec subsequently came into pwc to help them ratchet up their compliance procedures that's what happens when you have a more liberal regime it allows you allows the for a less confrontationist attitude between the uh, government and for the and for the business to allow for moving up you know the making the making the crime environment less pro, making the environment less prone to crime okay that okay. that i think is very and important and making the environment more conducive to business is what Absolutely. you are suggesting okay there, all right there's let, a, yeah there's our just one catch to what sir has said see whenever you decriminalize a provision uh, a particular offense a particular provision i would say so compounding happens primarily against payment of some money yeah. so there's something called as plea bargaining so the person who is affected you know he'll accept some money from the offender now this is this come and that is how it comes in the civil uh, re, uh, civil domain that essentially entails payment of some money this money will be paid out of business so then it is it will be accounted in the, the business, business cost yeah so look at so, look at so, it okay, from so, that perspective okay, so that's why the catch is is what you're yeah. suggesting all right mr duwa your thoughts on what what both the gentlemen have said and also is there a lack of trust between the government and industry uh, mr brahma as a jurisprudence expert has endorsed the principle which i was talking about and i think is developed it further much more than i had thought that but that's the along the lines i am i am suggesting all the grouping of the so called 46 amendments which are being proposed we looked at second i would say what is equally important for foreign investors particularly the indian is that our regulations remain certain and predictable they do not mind if you keep them so the a particular thing is an offense today they don't mind keep it as a offense or if it is a bailable one non bailable one if it's a civil or it is that but what also bothers them is overnight changes in regulations for instance the he gave the very right example of corporate social responsibility is it a criminal offense in india is it a bailable of, is it a civil offense and the how is the 2% defined whenever so, so what i urge is not that it's not happening is i'm reiterating probably this that any change in established laws or enacting new laws must go through a thorough process of formulation consultation and then only we propose amendments or bring about the new law see changing a corporate social responsibility you knock us act per se some people will call it within a year you amend it first you make it criminal criminalize that act then so people protest bring it to your notice you change so such i would say anything which is you know i would say of impacting more than an individual it's a business environment etc the foreign investors there are countries like germany countries like germany japan where a lot of these things are not compoundable yet people know that this is what would happen if we cross the you know the 
at the threshold limit or if we cross the line. If it's a, it's a red line, it remains a red line. So that is one point. Sorry, the second point which, which was… Is there a lack of trust between uh, the government uh, and industry? Uh, I would say, I won't call it, there is one, but there is a, there is a suspicion post the 2012 developments, whether it was in 5G, uh, 2G allocation, whether it was in coal and post that the, when the banks have felt the pinch of a lot of NPAs and some of those borrowers disappearing during the Fugitive Act. So the, the government agencies have become more uh, kind of, I would say, stringent. Vig string vigilant, stringent, tax and that includes the government. So to that and at the same time, the businessmen are themselves experiencing the impact of global slowdown as well as their domestic so slowdown. So the bon homie and the trust, mutual trust, which was probably there between the two of them was, is bound to get to some extent. Re you know, people start, because they're not doing well. Mm -hmm. So when you are not doing well, you are also always looking for where do I lay the blame? Right. And the government comes in handy as the punching bag. Okay. Okay. Shuboy, taking the discussion forward now, how big an issue is really compliance to some of these raw r rules, regulations and, you know, policies that we have in place? No, I agree. I mean, I agree with Mr. what Mr. Dua is saying about uh, the, uh, ensuring that there isn't too many changes. But it's also about having smart policies, smart laws. Let's take an example. For years, we have been handling this NBC, uh, NPA crisis cases. There was a Surface A Act and there was before that the, and after that, there have been so many cases. It didn't really help. But look at IBC. IBC doesn't have any penal provision. At least, I mean, the, excepting those who are handling it if there's a certain malefact. But otherwise, there's no penal fight. But it's such a smart act that it has ensured far amount of resolution than any other act that has been uh, put in the corporate sector. But with amendments, if I might say, every session of parliament. It has needed. Wait, no, it no, was necessary. So, it was necessary no. because unless you did it. Because, for instance, no, the promoters no, no, no. wanted to come in through the uh, back Mr. door. Mr. Dua is suggesting do so after discussing it the thoroughly and then go ahead, you don't need any. No as, we have, as, no, as we had also discussed, as we had also written in the paper, that the government has actually, every time there's been a challenge, the government has actually been, in this case, in the case of IBC, it has been good to take on the change immediately. It was necessary because that was a case because that was IBC was frankly being initially being gamed and that gaming was necessary to stop it. But there have been lots of other cases like in the case of FERA and FEMA, which Ajay is pointing out. FERA was a criminal case, I mean, it was a criminal offence. It FEMA came in with civil, ability, with civil liabilities. But over the years, FEMA has got back criminal provisions. That's bad. That doesn't help at all. Because that essentially means that the government, what is the government is doing is essentially saying that I don't have the ability, like the IBC, unlike the IBC, I don't have the ability to handle it through the normal courts. So therefore, I use the fear of criminal act to make business fall in line. Mm. This is a very bad mentality. This doesn't help. And that is where the problem comes in. Because it, it's like that since I, since I don't know how to go through the courts, I give the example of the Satyam case. So therefore, I will use the fear of a crime to instill behavior change. And frankly, that creates adversarial position. And that is where all this issue is coming about, which just doesn't help anyone. Right. Right. You know, Mr. Dua, uh, just to take the point forward, you know, the fact of the matter is at the end of the day, our laws, laws are also condemned for not being abreast with the time. So that also is an issue and they need to be amended from time well, to time. Of course, there is no doubt at all the laws must be contemporary and you cannot have antiquated or outdated laws in position. But here we are talking about the example of the act which it took. It's a very recent mm. act, probably needed and helping out even the NPA's problem resolution of NPA. I can see the benefits of it straight away. But my point is whether a promoter can bid, the ex-promoter can bid for the assets or not. A very important point. Maybe we could have thought about it right when we enacted it, rather than when the process is on, some ex-promoters have bid and ex-promoters have tied up overseas with their funding agencies or their partners, etc. Minor issues, etc. can always be tweaked and brought about procedurals. A lot of these changes are 
actually procedural. But the substantive ones have to fit into the frame of the law, uh, framework of the law when it is being thought of. Hmm. Okay. So I would look at it that major changes, and I would say whether promoters can, the ex-promoters can buy their assets now at a lower price than hmm. what they uh, what hmm. they owed is a substantive one. Right. That kind of a thing probably should have been considered ab initio at the ab initio itself when we framed the law. Okay, all right. So, uh, Ajay, since we are here, what's the best way forward then in trying to deal and address this whole problem? Do we look at, you know, changing some of the acts or the laws whole hog or maybe have some rules and policy level changes here and there? I think, see, as we have, in our, in our discussion, during the course of the discussion only, I think we have talked about a principle. So, we should agree upon a principle that in case it's an offence, which is not compoundable under section 320 as I explained, CRPC. Whereas it, it, it you know, continues to remain an offence under IPC and other provisions. Then I think decriminalizing those kind of provisions, like what they are doing in this uh, particular, uh, I would say, um, stage of amendment. And uh, I am conscious by when I say that they are doing stages of amendment. <laughs> so, for instance, this related tran party transactions or repeat offenders. Now, all those provisions, th these are serious offenses, serious matters. Now, these matters cannot be decriminalized, should not be decriminalized, but that is exactly what they are trying to do. So, I would say we need to balance both civil and uh, criminal uh, elements of a particular act. Right. Otherwise, it will remain a paper tiger. Okay. All right. Shubhama, your concluding remarks on the program? Basically, get the enforcement right. I mean, uh, having too many acts with too many of these sharp provisions, I mean, I don't think over the last so many years, we have exactly been very good at punishing white collar crimes. So, essentially, get cleaner acts, less of these provisions, because so that it does not burden the uh, agencies which are trying to prosecute those with huge amount of cases and show that there are some good cases where the authority of the state has been ensured. I think that that that's the best way to go forward. All right. And Mr. Doha, close the show for us with a concluding uh, remarks. Steps being taken, the intention extremely desirable. Yes, we need to remove this needle of suspicion or the growing suspicion which business thinks that the authorities have. And decriminalization of the offenses, many of them in the current laws, the three laws which we have named, is highly desirable. However, just a word of caution that let us not swing completely on the other side of the pendulum because then we might see the courts themselves intervening and saying how collectively committed it is not, it is compoundable, individually committed it is not, then that is now equality or similarity or whatever the principles the legal minds would say. Second, whatever we do, let us do it to remain on the statute book for a reasonable period of time. So, all the learning which comes beyond after this, which has come so far, let us not be in a hurry to introduce the laws, but consider every aspect of it, bring them in, enact them, and I am sure the country will support it, business community will support it, so with the two houses of parliament, but then give it them reasonable time to be, to, to, to have their outcomes experienced. Okay. We need to strike a balance. We need to also think it through before we go ahead with any decision is what the panelists are suggesting. With that, it's a wrap on this edition of The Big Picture. Thank you to all my guests for joining me on the program and putting things into perspective for us. That's it from me. See you again next time.